Uh, good morning again to everyone. Good morning. Yeah. So it's the most, it is the quintessential late spring morning here. I hope it is for you all as well. The, the sky is just completely blue. The sun is shining and it, you know, it's just, it's still, there's barely any breeze and the birds are singing, wonderful. And I, so I was sitting here kind of in my mind composing what I was gonna talk about this morning when I got the text from Todd that said Jim had had a heart related event last night and was in the hospital. And certainly in that moment changed the complexion of the morning. But it brings home in a vivid and immediate way, the truth of Shakyamuni's teaching about impermanence. In the moments that we're comfortable, in the moments that we're content, in the moments that we're happy, we can kind of delude ourselves that that's going to be the state of our of our life or of our day, of our week, whatever it is. And yet impermanence is always present. It's always just around the corner. Everything changes. Can't hear you, Peter. I think you muted yourself accidentally. I think I muted myself accidentally. I think that's correct. <laughs> I didn't do that. There are gremlins in my porch here that probably came in and muted me. Um, anyway, so as I was saying, I mean, this, this is, you know, an immutable truth. It's, it's, it's a reality at, at every moment of our lives that impermanence is there and everything changes and everything transforms and everything grows old and everything dies. But this was also the, the, the power and the beauty of the Buddha's teaching because he came right at this. He didn't pretend it doesn't happen. He doesn't talk about the fact that, yeah, that's gonna happen, but you're gonna get rewarded in another life, right? He came right at it and he said, we need to find a way to deal with that suffering here and now in living our lives as human beings. That, that's really quite unique, a, quite a unique thing about Buddhism as, as the Buddha taught it. We don't run from these things. We don't deny these things. We embrace them knowing that they're part of our lives, part of our existence as human beings. And in order to embrace them, we have to let go of many, many, many things that we cling to. You know, I mean, if, if we buy the sh a shiny new car, the next day it has a scratch, it has mud on it, right? It's, it's no longer a new car, it's on its way to being an old car. And that's the way it is with everything in life, everything in life. You know, I'm getting this shown to me very dramatically here, right on my road in Unity, because we have the infestation of the brown tail moths. 
And I'm, I'm personally, we're, personally, we're very fortunate because we don't have the tree species on our property and our neighbors on their property too, that, that the, the brown tome was like. Right. So they have a decided preference for oak trees. And the other tree that's getting hit really hard right now are apple trees. So this is incredibly sad, you know, because if you go half a mile from our house, either way, you can see that you can see the trees under siege. And this is, I think, the second year, maybe the third year in a row that these trees are being denuded by by the activity of uh, the caterpillars. And they can only, uh, my understanding is, my recollection is that they can only withstand about three years. You know, if, if they're defoliated consistently, they can't survive. And so we've got these beautiful oak trees. Some of these oak trees around here are probably 200 years old. Just gorgeous, big, spreading, beautiful beings. And I don't know if they're going to make it. The apple trees, as many of you know, like, you know, some of these apple trees are 100, 150 years old going, you know, surviving from the old farmsteads that were here in the past. And you see the, the twisted and gnarled branches of these kind of venerable trees. And I don't know if they're going to make it. And it's and it, that's certainly it really it pains me very deeply because I love these trees, you know, to think that they may perish on moss is incredibly sad. And you know, so nature has its cycles, yeah. So once the moths can uh, consume all their feed, they'll go away again for a while, but it'll take a couple of hundred years to regrow those trees. So the devastation will be there well beyond our lifetimes. So this is why we practice. This is why we sit, at least in part. The reality of impermanence, reality of impermanence. You know, climate change is gonna is hitting the trees already in this state. Lots, lots of diseases attacking them. I just saw that the that the beech trees have a new disease that's that's attacking them. And 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 what we're gonna see, you know, among at a minimum is some of the more northern species, the the um the spruce and firs that are characteristic of the boreal forest, I imagine will be dying back and, and more hardwoods will be coming in, more moving up from the south. Is that a good change or is it a bad change? You know, so I, what the Buddha taught us is that, the, you know, that the pain that arises from this, the grief that arises from this comes from our own attachments. I feel the pain from those, the passing of the oak trees or the potential passing of the oak trees because I'm attached to the oak trees. And I freely admit that I am. <laughs> we can't go through life without attachments. I'm sorry, Buddha. But it's those of us who live in the world, who have families, who have partners. Cannot go through life with no attachments. And cannot feel not not feel loss and sadness and grief. Cannot not feel pain.
so does that invalidate the Buddha's teachings? Or make them irrelevant? I don't think so. I think what, if the Buddha were here today, perhaps what he would say is, yes, we have to experience those things. That is part of the nature of living life as a human being. But we also have to avoid clinging to them. This is how I see the teaching applying in our in our lives today. When we experience a loss, we need to grieve. We need to feel the pain and the sadness. We need to cry the tears. And as Zen practitioners, we need to feel those acutely. We need to allow the pain, not resist it. We need to allow the sadness, not resist it. We need to cry the tears, not resist them. And, and grieve fully and deeply and completely. And then move on. Where we might err is in staying stuck in those places everything changes. And just as there is sadness and grief, there is happiness and joy. There is pleasure and fun. There's healing and growth. So to some extent, but we, what we have to do is engage and engage fully that's what Zen asks us to do with whatever is, whatever state we are in, whatever state is around us. When there is suffering, we need to be at one with that suffering. When there is joy, we need to be at one with that joy. And in that way, we are living life fully. We are fully expressing our nature as human beings. And because we are doing that, we are not suffering. Suffering comes from clinging. Suffering comes from resisting. Suffering comes from picking and choosing. Different teachers have expressed this differently. Now, this is not the same as acceptance. You know, in kind of in Western psychology, we talk a lot about it and in Addiction recovery, all these places we talk about acceptance. Acceptance is kind of enduring something we don't like. And this is really different, a little bit different. It's a subtle shade different, but it's a vital shade. It's allowing and embracing it as part of the totality of this human experience. Experience. You know, so that when these things rise up at us, We live, we live them deeply and fully. You know, it's, it's, we're kind of like the surfer, right? When the surfer, when a wave comes, the surfer could kind of stand there and let the wave hit them full on, right? Or they could be dragged about by it, but they get up on their board and they ride with it, whatever it is, right? And they know eventually that wave is going to end. <laughs> you know, all waves end, unless you get into fractal theories and stuff. And then they, they might they might they might disagree with that. But you 
you know, broadening this out a little. I mean, we live constantly now with this realization that we're destroying the environment. You know, that's, that's an omnipresent reality in our lives today. And when we are awake to it, there's, there's, there's a whole range of uncomfortable emotions that are awakened. Fear and sadness and doubt and confusion and anger. And, you know, all of these things come up when we witness what's happening to the, to the earth, to the natural world. And yet if we stay there, that results in paralysis and despair. And when we fall into paralysis and despair, we can't fix anything. We can't help anything. You know. So in terms of our engagement with the world, we have to be awake. We have to be honestly aware of what's happening. We have to grieve. We have to shed tears. And hopefully we also take action. But we're always but we need to ride that wave, not get sucked in by it so that we're depressed and we're paralyzed and we're being carried away by the undertow. When that happens, we're not benefiting ourselves or, or the world. So, so that's the other, the other concept of the Buddhas that applies here is the middle way, the middle way. Right? Walking, walking between the different extremes of reality. Finding a path where we can live our lives, where we can heal the world, where we can be present for our loved ones and our friends, our colleagues, helping to sustain them and heal them without getting dragged down by our, ourselves. It's quite an art to live that way. And yet that's what's being demanded of us all, probably at all times throughout human history, but certainly right in this moment right now, when things are pre so precarious, we have to maintain the balance. We have to stay on the board. And if we're on the board, then we can reach out, pull others up. Isn't it amazing that a guy sitting in the jungle in India 2,500 years ago figured this all out and, and has a message and a teaching that's so present for these times. So I'll close by talking for a minute or two about the, the topic I was actually gonna talk about before I got waylaid which is Atadipa. Atadipa is, it's something that we, it's a, the Atadipa Sutra, the entire sutra was the last teaching of Shakyamuni Buddha when he was lying on his deathbed, surrounded by his students and his students were de despairing. How are we gonna go on? How are we gonna practice the Dharma? We're losing you. And the Buddha gave them a reassurance. He said, look within, you are the light. The light is within. 
look within. You are the light. The light is, there's many translations of this, most of which I don't like, but that's the one I like the best. You know, he was saying, you don't need me to go on because you all have the capacity within you. You all carry the light within you. You all are the Buddha. You all have the ability to respond with compassion. You all have the respond. We all have the, res the ability to be there for others and help others to deal with the things that they encounter. And then he, and he further said, you know, and the Dharma is the light, the Dharma. So we all, we have the Dharma. We have such gifts. We are so fortunate to have encountered this way and to have this teaching that helps us to discover our own light, to discover our own truth. and live in a way that's full and deep and authentic in the midst of crisis. In the midst of the brown tail moths devouring the oak trees. because there will always be brown tail moths. Thank you. Uh, Peter, a comment that you made that uh, that stuck with me was uh, to embrace something, we need to let go. And uh, I had never thought about it quite that way because I think of embracing as being such an active verb of moving toward and letting go is sort of uh, sort of the opposite, um, but also is very descriptive of um, of the state that that you would be in if you did let go. You would just be open to what's here and to your point of being different than um, uh, acceptance, uh, seeing that, that this is where we are and um, I don't know, it's a, it's a subtle difference and I'm not, explaining that very clearly, but I did like to embrace something you need to let go. And my brown tail moth right now are the hordes of people who have been confined the last 14 months and have decided they want to come to Commercial Street in Portland, Maine. <laughs> uh, and I would like to embrace them um, and I think, yes, letting go of my expectations of how I would want things to be is probably a good first step. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing you could do is if you get a few sackfuls of those brown tail morph caterpillars <laughs> and turn them loose on commercial street, you'll solve two problems. Um, well, that would attract the seagulls, <laughs> but you know, that's all right. I'd rather have them. All right. So now this is the question that I, that Elizabeth and I were talking about yesterday. Can the, 
the various predators that eat the ca eat caterpillars, will the venom of the brown tail moths affect them so they won't eat them? Mm. Oh. That's the profound question for today. That is a koan. <laughs> so. Hey, Peter, um, one of the things I wrestle with, and I'd, I'd like your thoughts on it, is the despair that so often accompanies the uh, the emotions and the thoughts that you're, you're talking about. Um, you know, the despair of what's happening environmentally. You know, what good is it for the surfer if he's on the board or she's on the board and riding the wave, but it's just riddled with despair. Well, You know, you know I, I, this is a little gets a little more psychological maybe than Dharma, I'm not sure, but you know, this despair is paralysis. Once we get that far into the into the um, into the state of of fear or of loss or of grief or what, any of those things that that we are despairing, then we're then we're paralyzed and we're not of any good to anyone. Right. And, and, and so, you know, in, in certain, in, in a certain sense, you know, the, I've said this before, you know, doing anything is better than doing nothing. Right. And, and, we, and, if it's, and if this, you know, and we can't see the path, we can't see the future. I can't, you know, none of us can, you know, what's going to end, you know, what's the end of this story? Is it the end of nature? I don't think so. Is it the end of humanity? That's entirely possible. But I can't see that. And I can't, you know, we're, we're living in this universe that is a vast array of chaotic systems interacting with one another in ways that absolutely defy prediction of even of our, you know, most sophisticated computers or whatever, because there's so much complexity. There's so much chaos existing in this, that, you know, and yet we also have some power in that. We also have some ability to determine outcomes, you know? So, so again, these sort of paradoxes, you know, we're, we're absolutely powerless in the midst of this huge mess. And yet we also have some power. Um, you know, and so I think if I, the, the despair arises when I don't no longer believe that I have any power, when I no longer believe that my actions matter, when I no longer believe that, I, that there can be possibly be a good outcome. I don't know that. You know, I, you know, I, I, people sometimes think that, you know, hear me talk and they think that I'm a pessimist. And I don't think that I am. I mean, oh, you got to be positive about the future. No, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I don't think we have to be positive about the future. I think we have to be realistic. We don't know what the future is going to bring. And over here, there's all these really terrible outcomes. And over here, these positive outcomes. And we don't know. And, and, to, and in some ways, to be positive is to be in denial of that reality. And it to be in, and also to kind of alleviate our responsibility. If I know there's this and this, and I don't know which way the scale is going to tip, I'm going to try to get on the scale and tip it the way I want it to tip. But if I think, oh, you know, oh, it's all going to be good, you know, pass the bag of chips and, <laughs> you know, whatever. So, so I think that's the other thing. I think living in this. It's sort of a dynamic state between positive and negative. And looking squarely at the reality, we can respond in ways that we cannot respond if we allow ourselves to fall to one side or the other. Is that make, am I making any sense or am I just babbling on here? No, you're making sense. 
and, and you know, and the, the moments of despair are natural. That's the other thing. They're natural, you know. I certainly have them, you know. But um, <laughs> every time I look at the news, as a matter of fact. But but that said, you know, again, I've got to let that pass. I can't stay there and cling there. I've got to let that pass. Okay, I'm feeling this despair. And then in the next moment, I'm going to take action or in the next moment, I'm going to take a nap, whatever it is, but I'm moving past, moving past staying stuck in the despair. Thank you. That's yeah. You know, I, I think that's where we as Buddhists as have a huge, you know, contribution to eco Dharma to, to, you know, and is that are that we are working on cultivating this ability to face reality without needing to paint it any one way or another to satisfy our own personal agendas you know to look at the truth to talk about the truth to to experience the truth that, that's not an easy thing to do is it and 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 not many people are doing that right now Right. If we look around the world, it, you know, why is all this insanity? I just read a, a wonderful piece, a wonderful article. On, I haven't digested it yet by by Bruce um, K. Alexander, who some of you may know of him from his his Rat Park studies. And um, anyway, in the nutshell, he was one. He was one of the researchers who did the original experiments with drugs where they put rats in cages with little bottles of water that were laced with heroin and cocaine. And, and then the, the outcome was that the rats just stood there pressing the bar until they died, right? But then he got looking at that and he decided that that was a completely unrealistic experiment. So he created what they called Rat Park. And Rat Park was a community of rats and they had places to play. They could procreate. They could do all the things that rats do in this park. So interestingly enough, in that situation, when the rats pressed the bar and tried the, the, the cocaine or the heroin, they had both choices, or they had plain water. The rats opted for the plain water. <laughs> they, most of them never went back to the drugs. They tried the drugs, they tried the plain water, they preferred the plain water. There was a small percentage who went back occasionally to the drugs. None of the rats addicted, none of the rats died of addiction. This, these studies, this study was done in the 70s. It's the most revolutionary study ever done on, on addiction. And, it, and it's been largely ignored because it, it flies in the face of the sort of medical pharmaceutical view, view of addiction and of the patholo pathologizing the individual, something wrong with them, you know, as opposed to there's something wrong, you know, the, the, the broad implication of, of Alexander's work, obviously there's something really fucked up with our society. So he just wrote this, this article that he, that he just wrote that I just read. And, you know, that's what he's saying in the broadest view using addiction in the broadest way, uh, you know, to, to include all the, the internet and gambling and, you know, all the, the myriads of things that Americans are, are addicted to, you know? And, and his conclusion is, you know, it, it's, it, it's the society, it's the, the ill health of our society. And this is unprecedented in the history of humanity. You know, hum, humans have always used substances, but to have, the percentage of the population that we do addicted is unprecedented in human history. Something really, really wrong. Okay. Really, really wrong. And, and, um, you know, so that could, could, could lead us to despair as well. But I, but to me, it, 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 you know, it creates, it opens the space to look at it differently and say, you know, how do we change? How do we heal? How do we do better? How do we support each other in community? And this is what I believe that we as Buddhists have. You know, we have our three treasures, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Community is essential to us. It's essential to our practice. 
you know, and we're willing to look at it. We're willing to, you know, not obscure these things and say, nope, I've got to take, you know, I don't like this fact. I've got to take another drink. Oh, I don't like this fact. I've got to take another hit on a joint. And I'm not saying any of you, you know, <laughs> people may or may not have a drink or have a, have a hit on something. I, that's irrelevant. What I'm talking about is that sort of addiction, that, that urge to blot out reality, that urge, you know, to, to not face our human condition in this world in this time. And that's that's our gift to the world if we choose to give it. And we was guard up against you know there are people who are addicted to the Dharma. Addicted to retreats. I've run into people like that. I say, you know, how are you? Oh, I went to this retreat. And then I went over here to this retreat. And I went to so-and-so's retreat. And it's like, you know, what are you running away from? What is it that you don't want to face in reality? So even a fundamentally good thing, the Buddha Dharma, can become an addiction, can become an escape. Okay. Any closing thoughts or questions? Okay. Creations are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. Reality is boundless. I vow to perceive it. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Creations are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. Reality is boundless. I vow to perceive it. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Creations are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. Reality is boundless. I vow to perceive it. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Okay, thank you everyone. Go out, enjoy this day, have a good week.